are Agustinos. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Hello, how are you? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank oh, you. my. I'm so glad to be here. Indeed. Now, before you share the tips to write a good mm -hmm. and compelling travel story, I would like to take you back, way back, probably almost 20 years ago, when you started, <laughs> when you discovered your love of traveling. I mean, what was the first country that you visited and what was your experience and what prompted you to write down these experiences? Yeah, so um, I started by, I lived in China before as a mm. student. Uh, mm. Back then in the uh, year 2003, uh, there was a summer holiday, so I, I was thinking of going to Afghanistan. Mm. Um, uh, the re Taliban regime was uh, toppled down by the uh, US invasion in 2001, so it was quite... Uh, well, crazy adventure to go to Afghanistan in 2003, just two years after the Taliban. Mm -hmm. And um, well, and after that, I saw Afghanistan was totally different from uh, what I saw from the media. Mm. And I realized it was a very beautiful country mm -hmm. with very nice people. And mm -hmm. I, I, I felt that there was so many precious uh, experience uh, that I learned in Afghanistan that I wanted to share. So there, that's how I started to be a photojournalist and then eventually I became a writer. Very briefly, what was that one precious experience that you remember until now about Afghanistan that clearly <laughs> most of us globally we don't know because every time we watch the media when we talk about Afghanistan, we talk about terrorism, we talk about Taliban, we talk about attacks, we talk about war. But I'm sure and as you know, it's yeah. so much more than that. Yeah, Afghanistan is a very uh, historical country and it was the center of civilization. So. Mm. Afghanistan was the land where uh, very important and sacred land of the Buddhist religion. Okay. So Buddhism developed in Afghanistan first, before even before China uh, knew Buddhism. Wow. So uh, Buddhism started from India, spread to Afghanistan. It was developed there, and the, uh, the culture of making Buddha statues started in Afghanistan. Wow. Then Buddhism spread to Central Asia, and from Central Asia, it spread to China. So it was amazing. Now many people forgot the history as Afghanistan was a, a, a center of Buddhist civilization. Wow. Oh, I no so idea. yeah, and and it is also a very important part of the Silk Road. So so. That's amazing. Yeah. That's the first. That was during the first century, right? When Buddhism yeah, first yeah, in. yeah. And it, there was a very huge statue, uh, uh, the tallest standing Buddha statues uh, in Bamiyan in Afghanistan. That was. Uh, exploded by by the oh. Taliban in 2001 so yeah I, I, I went there and and the feeling was very painful to see just this kind of um, historical site yes. was totally destroyed only two years before I arrived wow. yeah wow. so um, take us back as well since you're taking us back a few years here um, when you decided to share your travel experiences through literature. Mm -hmm. um, you obviously have a background of uh, being a journalist and mm -hmm. you're, I'm sure, a great writer. But what about, like, how does one even start? If somebody wants to do this, I'm sure there's a lot of benefits. For example, yeah. you can focus a lot more as to what's going on as opposed yeah. to just be trying to take pictures all the time. Yeah. But at the same time, how do you file away all of these experiences and how do you decide, okay, this is what I'm going to write about? Mm. Okay, so, well, uh, I didn't start as a journalist. My background was a computer science. Oh, wow. okay. uh, Amazing. Being a writer doesn't mean that you have to be a journalist oh, for a student. Okay. So I learned all of the techniques from the road. So I wanted to be, first I wanted to be a photojournalist. Then I could capture the moments right. like this, uh, these pictures. And, and uh, after that, I learned that uh, for being a good writer, it's not enough that you have a sensual uh, observation. Okay. So first, it's very important that you really observe things and you really feel the, your experience. Mm. But the other thing that is very important for writer is you can see your experience from the bigger picture. Mm. So after you experience uh, all of your experience on the road, you meet these people, you see these places, it's also very important for you to contemplate the meaning of your experience. So what is the meaning of this experience for me? And what is the meaning of this experience for public in general? Because you don't need to share all of your details of daily activity on the road. Right. right. Because it will be it will be very boring for your yeah. readers. Yeah. Right. It's you, like a list of things. Right. Yeah, I wake up at this time, I eat this, I, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
had bagels in the morning for breakfast in New York. Yeah, it is like uh, when you were given homework when you were in primary right. school by your teacher. But, <laughs> but for writer, no, it's not enough. I, I suppose it's it's because it's not it's not a travel guide. Like they they have those out there yeah. as well, right? But you know, yes. But that, I think that's the thing, right? I mean, each writer has has his or her own style because. Right. Some people might want to sort of like have this Lonely Planet style where sure, it's like yeah. go to this place, go to sure. that place, yeah. this is the price and all that. But yours is very interesting because it mixes uh, your contemplation, like, yeah. like the meaning yeah. of these travels for you, but at the same time it's also very informative. <laughs> Could you please give us an example of the process of your writing? For example, when you're writing about uh, when you were traveling the borders of mm -hmm. Indonesia. Mm -hmm. it's like, how do you combine the stats, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the facts, mm -hmm. but also at the same time making it super engaging mm -hmm. that it's very, it feels very human and easy to read. Okay, so yeah, uh, the process is when you travel, mm -hmm. uh, you need to, to, before you travel, if you want to be a writer, you need to have a preparation. You mm -hmm. just don't go to places and then ex expect that you experience nice things that you can write about. Okay. Okay. So before going, it's very important to know what you're going to write, what you, what you want to learn. Mm -hmm. So before I started my journey in uh, Papua New Guinea, for example, I wanted to know the meaning of the border between Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. We see on the map, it's a straight line right. with the little birds and yeah, yeah and what it, what, what it actually means. So I, I went to the border and then um, I traveled, I stayed with the people and then um, uh, I interacted with them. It was a very difficult journey and then I had to, to do many of um, really dangerous adventures actually. Such as? There such as hitchhiking uh, canoes because there were no road. It was totally jungle over there and no road. And the only uh, way to travel is by river. And there was no boat, no, no public boat, public ship that you one. can buy the ticket, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I came to one village. I wait for, for, for this villager to go to the next village right. by boat. So I, 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 I took their boat and then go to the next, the next village and so on. So. One time I ended up in a refugee camp of the West Papuan uh, from Indonesian side of the border uh, and then they were supporter, many of them were supporter of this free Papua movement right. mm. and I was alone, I didn't even know, I, I arrived there alone and then uh, of course they suspected me as an, uh, being an Indonesian because they're fighting against the Indonesian government and but by communication i got accepted by them i sat with them and i, I learned uh, to 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 see the history from their perspective mm. so when i want to write about this mm. i have to contemplate what is the real meaning of this experience mm. for me and for others for example the meaning of border and then it rose me uh, uh give me many questions inside me mm. uh, why, why we became separated, why people are different, why, mm. uh, why there are countries and why people are suppressed because of different identities. Mm. So this kind of contemplation mm. is becoming the bigger picture. So when I want to convey my stories, I follow these questions and slowly, slowly it gives some, some kind of contemplation but not, not the, the, the direct answer. Mm. And then by doing this, your story will be very much focused. The yes. readers will get your uh, your idea, your message, but in a very, very hidden way, right. mm. and it will uh, will be much deeper in their uh, subconscious mind. Right. As a journalist, right, we we are always trained to be neutral. Yeah. As a travel, as you, as a journalist, but you're also a travel writer. Do you mm -hmm. infuse your subjective judgment into your writing? Yeah. Uh, for non -cre creative non-fiction, it's, it's not like a journalism reportage. Mm. It's more like... Um, Is it literary a, journalism? Yeah, yeah, fun? yeah. It, it's kind of essay. And, and, and as a literary journalism of creative non-fiction, of course, subjective judgment is very important. Mm. You, 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 have, uh, you have to have your point of view. You have to have your perspective and you, you have to defend your argument. Mm. But then you have to be very objective as well. You have to, uh, to give all of the context, all of the historical background, so people can see that you are not blindly subjective, but you have the reason. And, yeah. and of course, you, you need to have message. Otherwise, there is no, no such travel writing. It's just like reportage. Yeah. Yes. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. And I guess that, that, that uh, journalistic 
instinct is just still that underlying. It's yeah. there because yeah. that's what makes you ask these questions yeah. to yourself. Yeah. Um, a lot of the places that you've named so far, the Papua and Indonesian border, mm -hmm. um, Afghanistan, even the former Soviet Union, if we're not mistaken. Yeah. Like, do you, how do you, what's the process like of you choosing where you would like to go and spend a significant amount of time? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these places are not necessarily on people's travel list <laughs> as well. However, it does invoke a lot of these yeah. questions. Yeah. If you are there, yeah. a lot of these emotions that yeah. you normally wouldn't get if you were, say, go to Hawaii or Bali. Yeah. Example, right? You have a very personal story. On this yeah. yeah. So, in fact, I don't really plan. I don't really plan. If uh, I don't really know where I'm going, <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> I go, but really like impulsive. Like when I went to Afghanistan, for example, I was just in Pakistan, and then people said, "Yeah, Afghanistan is easy to visit." Now then I came to Afghanistan. Oh, so wow. really, I didn't have plan. But now, if I look back from my yeah. uh, uh, earlier experience, I think there is a connection with, as you said, my personal experience. Mm. I was raised as a Chinese Indonesian here. I was uh, raised with this question of identity during that time, uh, whether I'm Chinese or whether I'm Indonesian, yeah. and then with this kind kind of racial discrimination yeah. uh, and this kind of conflicts, it throws questions in, inside me, what is the meaning of identity? Mm. So now if I observe again uh, my past experience of traveling, I tend to visit uh, conflict places, uh, border areas, and then I'm also gravitated towards the minorities mm. because I think I saw my reflection there because the conflicts because of the border and the minority is all reflecting my own identity mm -hmm. and by seeing their conflicts i started to understand what is the meaning of my own conflict and i can make peace with my own conflicts yeah. so i think uh, traveling is kind of a healing for me as well how long did it take for you to realize that hey you know i'm healed because i remember you telling me when you were a child, you were quite protected by your parents. Mm -hmm. You couldn't really go out freely. You would always be with, um, you know, with your nanny and all that. You used to be very afraid going out. Mm -hmm. But look at you now, right? <laughs> it's like, what, 30, 35 yeah. years later, yeah. you are out here <laughs> and traveling to all these exotic places that very, very few people think about. You know, mm -hmm. how long did it take for you to realize that, hey? I'm actually feeling all right now. I feel quite free and I'm okay. I think it, it's, it's a process. It's just not like immediately. Mm. Mm. First, I think this, the, my stepping point was I went to China to study. Mm. And uh, when I was in Indonesia, I was thinking that I'm Chinese because of the discrimination. Yeah. When uh, I walk on the street, people would say, people would China, say it's China. You. Yeah, right? and then of course, yeah, I'm Chinese right. there. Yes. But then I came to uh, China, I was treated like Indonesian. You're like, oh, yeah, they're Chinese. Yeah, 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 foreigner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then I started to see like the culture is different, the way of life is different. For example, at that time, the Chinese people like to spit a lot. Mm. And when I was a kid, my, my parents said, no, you, no, you should you not spit. spit. <laughs> we Chinese never spit. But when in China, everybody spit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started, well, are we the same Chinese? Right. So this is the first step, like, okay, uh, identity is something very uh, fluid. It can okay. change, yeah? yeah. It, it depends on where you are, depends on your story, depends on your environment. Then uh, also being in China, I started to feel that I, I have the uh, courage to, mm. to travel by my own. Mm. But the real healing process, I think, is through writing. Ah. Writing. It's, it's ah. not only by visiting the places, but when, when I contemplate my experience, mm -mm. because writing is a different process uh, from uh, traveling. Right? Okay. When, yes. when traveling, you just observe. Then when, uh, when you do the writing, you, you have to replay all of the memory inside yes. your head. And then you have to keep asking questions and yes. keep debating with yourself. So when I write ah. my stories, I also have to debate with myself the real question inside me, my inner questions, mm. and what is the answer? And that is the process of healing. How long does it take to write a book this thick? Because all of your books tend to be <laughs> yeah, they're, not, uh, <laughs> they're like serious writing, man. <laughs> this one is two years. Two. This one is yeah, two years. Zero. This one is going to make us a movie soon. Yeah. Whoa! Oh my God, I'm excited. Are you in need of a female lead? Because I know someone. I, I can be one of the travelers. Well, I can play a man. I can play you if you like. Anyway, this book, right? The yeah. Signal, the one that is going to be uh, made into a movie very yeah. soon. There is a very interesting quote here, yeah. Agus. Perjalananku bukan perjalananmu. My journey is not your journey. Perjalananku adalah perjalananmu. My journey is your journey. What does that mean? Yeah, it sounds conflicting. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> 
confused. <laughs> you're very confused. So yeah, everybody, everybody journey is different. Like the places I visit, my ex, my life experiences, all different. Like I, I went to Afghanistan. Maybe you never think of going there. No. Yeah, I never. Especially now. <laughs> I never be a, pre a presenter, you become presenter. So everybody journey is different. Yeah. But if you see from the bigger perspective, yeah. everybody journey is similar. We all have the same dream, we all dreaming of uh, being happy, we have all the fear. And if you see in even in the conflict areas, the people that you think they are terrorists, like in Afghanistan, yes. they also have their own fun. They also, they, they're the same like us. They like to be happy. They like to hang out. Yeah. They also, uh, they also cry from for, for the same things. Yeah. They also have their own suffering. Yeah. So uh, when you can see the mirror of the journey in everybody's, it's, it's all the same. Then you will develop a tolerance. You don't see people from the identities, but you see people as people. Yes. You see people right. as people. That makes perfect mm -hmm. sense now. Quite that divine, sentence isn't it? that was very confusing to me exactly. now. Exactly. It <laughs> makes perfect sense. So um, this is going to be adapted into into a film. Yeah. Uh, are, so you're going to be how involved are you going to be in that? Uh, well, I'm involved in the process of the script writing as well. Yeah. I'm not the script writer, but I also right. I help the script writers to, to, to do this because this is my memoir. In yes. Fact. Yes. Uh, yes. I heard that this is the most famous with uh, Indonesian readers. Yeah. It's because it's reflective yeah. and it's it's quite emotional. So uh, oh, lovely. Uh, this is this is obviously like it took it took years to create this. Mm. Um, you had had to take a couple of years off uh, mm. due to the pandemic because yeah. it's definitely not in line with what yeah. you do. Yeah. Mm. Um, when can we expect you to start doing this again? Have you ever? Do you have any thoughts looking ahead? This is where I want to go next. I know you said you're quite spontaneous when it comes <laughs> to travel, but perhaps uh, do you have any plans looking ahead? Yeah, I think uh, pandemic changed people, changed a lot to me, yeah. and I realized that uh, somehow I had a kind of existential crisis because <laughs> I started, during the pandemic. During the pandemic, because yeah. I feel uh, now I realize I started to learn about the my personality and psychology. I learned that the my source of happiness is when I learn new things yeah. and I. Uh, I see new things, I meet new people, and I learn new things, I contemplate things. And this didn't happen during uh, my pandemic. I only stay at home and then like uh, doing the things that I don't really enjoy, like stock trading, and then I can be totally like a different life and not get stressed because of money. It's like... <laughs> right, that's not like the last yeah, thing Yeah, and lots of cut loss, cut loss, cut loss, and oh my God. And yeah, I'm, I'm dreaming of traveling again. I'm, I'm dreaming of refreshing my perspective and becoming my old me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So does it mean that after that existential crisis, mm -hmm. it's going to the new you, let's mm -hmm. say the new you, uh, we will see in the in future works because I heard that you're writing new books very yeah, soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing two books at the same time now. Oh so. my, oh my, what prolific <laughs> Because writers. of the pandemic, yeah, I have to do it. Uh, um, I'm, I'm writing a book, on, an essay book on uh, the meaning of identity. So it's kind of like observing our country. What is the meaning of country? What is the meaning of border? What is the meaning of religion? Like questions, questions and questions. Yes. Uh, the other book is about uh, to see Indonesia from outside the border. So we, Indonesia, we live in Indonesia, but if you ask what is the meaning of Indonesia, it's very hard to answer. We, yes. Most Indonesians never travel and see the whole country because it's so big. Yeah. So but big. I want to see Indonesia from outside the border. So, so from, how do you do that? From where? Suriname? I from? started from Papua New Guinea. Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, after I was in Papua New Guinea, I met this uh, uh, separatist movement over there. I went to Holland to meet the leader of Free Papua Movement and I, I met the uh, Malukun diaspora in uh, in Holland, mm -hmm. and then I also went to Suriname because mm -hmm. in, in when I was in Holland, uh, one Javanese Suriname to, Surinamese told me that in Suriname the Javanese Muslim pray towards two directions. Mm. Oh. So some people pray towards the west and some people pray towards the east. Maybe because? it's the only place in the world that they have two kiblat. Wow. How come? Yeah, because. Uh, Actually, if you see geographically, they pray toward the east because Mecca is on the east. Right. Yeah. But, um, the majority of them still pray towards the west because the, the ancestors in Java pray towards the west. Mm. So when they arrive in Suriname, they want to preserve the identity from their ancestors, the Javanese ancestors. So they still pray towards the west. 
That's so fascinating. <laughs> When is this going to be released again? I cannot wait. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hopefully next year. Okay. It's a new okay. pressure for okay. me. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I have a deadline. Yeah, it's good to have a deadline. <laughs> We actually, one of our uh, production team mentioned that while you were in Papua New Guinea, there was something unique you found in the language there. Can you tell okay. us a little bit about it? Okay. The Papua New Guinea is the most diverse country in the world in terms of language. Okay. So, Papua New Guinea has 840 languages. <gasps> it's number one in the world. In Indonesia has in Indonesia is second has 700 something languages. Papua New Guinea is much smaller with 840 languages. So you can walk only five kilometers and they speak totally different wow. languages. And uh, they don't have kind of like Indonesia bahasa Indonesia as their uh, uniting language. Mm -hmm. So the the most common use now in Papua New Guinea is talk pisin or a broken English. So, Can you give us an example? <laughs> yeah, the broken English is interesting because the, the talk piscine has a very limited vocabulary yeah. and then they have to be very creative in, in, in creating the words. Oh. Uh, for example, when you see uh, hair, yeah. they say grass belong head. Huh? So huh? the grass belong head. Grass belong head. Grass yeah. that belongs... Grass, yeah. grass belong head. Wow. So shampoo is grass belong... Uh, soap belong grass belong head. Uh, soap belong grass, grass belong, belong head. head. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. You're just using less words but to describe other things. But that's things. amazing. Yeah. It's, like, it's almost <laughs> makeshift. Exactly. Yeah, hospital, house sick. How oh, sick? Yeah. Hospital, how sick. Rumah sakit. And, yeah, rumah sakit, how sick. It's the same like Indonesian, but when they say the veterinary hospital, it's yeah. house dog sick. Oh. Wow. House dog sick, yeah. yeah. I think <laughs> if I spend like one month in Papua New Guinea, I yeah. can speak their language just like that. I think that, my kid no? speaks that language. And what well, uh, already, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, it, it's fascinating, it's fascinating. Uh, for example, Payan Piano is a uh, big pella bokis, suppose you fighting, make me cry. What? One more time? <laughs> big pella bokis, suppose you fighting, make me cry. Big pella means big, uh -huh. bokis, box, big box. Uh -huh. Suppose if, yeah, uh -huh. big boss, if you fight, he will cry. Oh, so the big boss, oh like if you fight, fight, he will cry. Yeah. Oh, it makes a noise like yeah. the music is... Yeah, <laughs> oh, you are so cute. It's adorable. Oh, big fella book is suppose you fight him and he cry. Wow, that's that to say long, piano. That's a long way to say piano. That is like super calibrous and abilitious. I can't even say it. It's amazing that you're very fluent in it. I know. Oh, we keep asking you these questions. You are a wonderful storyteller. Yeah. Just even sharing your anecdotes with us. It's so much fun to hear about all of them. And I, I suppose that is why your books are so so popular. So popular. How many languages do you speak? Foreign languages? Well, I. I learned a lot of languages, but now I speak fluently not many. I speak uh, quite fluent in Chinese and Persian. Okay. But in the past, I used to speak a lot of uh, in Russian and Urdu. Uh, I also learned talk pisin. Now I hardly speak talk pisin, but I still can understand when I read talk pisin. <laughs> I would love to talk like that to everyone. No. Just, <laughs> just back, house sick. back to basics. House yeah. dog sick. Uh, yeah, take your dog to the house dog sick. House dog sick, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So cool. Wow, fascinating. Wow, you have a rich, fascinating, fulfilling life, August. Would you agree? Thank you very much. I think it's it's the old me that I want to return. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I lose that part of you because yeah. uh, it's amazing. It should be more like you. Anyway, so you guys can know more. Obviously, there's uh, plenty of literature out there absolutely. that has been written by Mas Agus, and we look forward to many more. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely look forward to seeing Indonesia from the point of view of the yes. outside. That would be interesting because we we were born here, we yes. live here, we always see it from our point of view. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's really glad to talk with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>